picked a diverse range of questions as well. I think we've got some markets in there. We've got a little bit about politics, but we've also got a bit about the wider UK and world economy as well. So Old portfolios put in positive returns, and that momentum's carried into, into August. I know. Take them here and say, where's this cost of living crisis, which you lot are writing about? Mm -hmm. Because it's even the word crisis. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's there's cost of living pressure for some people. Yeah, and, yeah. That. and then when he sold it, the you know, cars are still on the road. The roads yeah. are as busy mm -hmm. as ever. People are in the shops. It is a different picture. And uh, I think the first one is we've, we've got a couple of clients saying, "A, hey, what's better to be investing in right now? Is it an ISA or is it a pension? Or about and then we've got, what would be better for the UK economy? Would it be Rishi Sunak or, or Liz Trust and uh, I'll, I'll the Americans get involved with Taiwan?" China situation as well, but yeah. there's a much movement with the markets uh, there. The, the Hello everybody and welcome to the True Potential Do More With Your Money podcast. It is episode 130 and it is, is, is August the 12th today. I'm delighted to be joined by Diane Patterson, by Mark Henderson, and by Phil Elvin. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Morning, morning. Diane. Uh, thank you for joining me, and thank you for helping me wade through some fantastic questions which we've been sent in by our clients, by our listeners, and by our advisors as well. And as we try to do with the Q&A side of things, uh, we've picked a diverse range of questions as well. I think we've got some markets in there. We've got a little bit about politics, but we've also got a, a bit but the wider UK and world economy as well. So we probably move, they're in order at the moment, but that doesn't necessarily, we'll stick to the order, <laughs> guys, uh, just to warn you in advance. Yeah. Um, but look, Mark, we'll, we'll, we'll chuck the, the hot potato, so, so to speak, straight across to yourself. We've got a question from Karen, which was talking about the positive market movements, which we've seen in July. And do we think that's, a sign of more positive things to come. I hope so, Dan. And um, thanks for the question, Karen. It's a real question, not one that we've yes. we've put in there to <laughs> yeah. start off on a positive note. Uh, but it is positive because July was a good month. You know that, that that when we look at the portfolios, the returns that clients have seen right across all five uh, profiles that we have. And by profiles, I mean from defensive, cautious, balanced, growth, and aggressive. All portfolios put in positive returns, and that momentum's carried into into August. I know it's the twelfth. Yeah. Bad day if you're a grouse, a good day if you're an investor, hopefully, you know, by, by close of place today. Uh, let's hope that we've got, you know, further, further good movement in not just the UK markets, but global markets. So, yes, uh, have, we, have we turned the corner? I think the corner, um, it could be quite a long corner, mm -hmm. quite, a, quite a broad one as well, because there's so much still happening in the world. And we'll, we'll cover that in, in further questions yeah. that we've, we've got. But a, a, strong, a strong July and carried forward into August so yeah, far. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think we've, we saw some good news. There's, there's some mentions about US inflation. Yeah. In later questions, and, and it looks like US inflation dropped ever so slightly. It it did, it, it, and it was it was below the consensus, below um, what what people were expecting, and that's really been a driver, um, not just for the UK, but for, uh, sorry, the US, but in in China as well. Yeah. Uh, there's different factors affecting inflation, but what's really important is that at eight point five against a, an expectancy of eight point seven. That's in the first indication that inflation in the US is starting to slow down yeah. and markets reacted positively yeah. to that. And it's mostly driven by lower fuel prices, um, new vehicle prices came down and airfares came down. Yeah. You know, it's still funny when you, you look at it from a UK point of view where um, US for their gas, a gallon of, of fuel over there is about £3.60 in UK yeah. terms. A gallon over here, despite the fact that you've had that sleight of hand where it's priced in litres, you know, it's over over nine pounds. Mm -hmm. So we're getting quite a big it's quite the difference. difference. There is, there is. Um, and Phil drives a gas guzzler anyway, so you know, yeah. he he's very keen on on looking at the the price of uh, all fuel fuels. at the pump. Yeah. All fuels, all yeah. fuels, yeah. including the including dyed diesel. No, no, just just the ones that you can get from. That's right. Normal petrol. The official. <laughs> the so official all the official fuels. If you're listening and you work for customs and excise, no. don't stop Phil and give him the DAB <laughs> test on the way home tonight. Right. Um, but I, I think you, you mentioned a great thing about fuel, um, Mark, I, I, and, and actually about the wider economy as well. If we go back to, say, the podcast last year and the year before, and we were talking about some of the problems, we had the, the, the issues 
with the Panama Canal with yeah. supply. Uh, We've had issues with uh, chip shortages. That's silicon chips, Diane. Not, <laughs> not, not, not potato fishing, chips. Not fish and chips uh, from <laughs> there. Um, and also with China and various lockdowns and yeah. things. And actually, if you now look and you study these things, which I know Mark, you and the team do, a lot of those pressures have now been relieved. You know, yeah. so, so China's back open a wee bit more. There's better trade coming across from Asia again. The chip factories are open. OPEC are producing more fuel. Yeah, the needed, and that's not getting reported. No, as, it, as well, it's supply and demand, Dan, <clears> as, you, as you've touched on there. And one of the, the it, it, that leads nicely into the, the Chinese inflation figures, where one of the biggest impacts was was the rising cost of, of food. Now, it, it's it sounds strange talking about it, but the the cost of pork in in China actually had gone up, yeah. and that that fed r really into the the inflation figures. So the, there was a slowdown in in production but an increase in demand and price prices go up yep. and they feed into the inflation figures yep. so much different um component parts you know it's like it's like the the uk inflation and the us inflation but th these are are, are are lag indicators because you're experiencing those price increases now yep. and then it gets reported you know if if you talk about nine percent inflation in the uk that's not to say from the date that that's announced that everything is going to go up by nine percent. Mm -hmm. It's already happened. It's already cooked mm -hmm. in. Yeah. And when you yeah. go, you know, you go to the shop, you buy, let's say, you buy some, some milk, some bread, some eggs. You don't think, oh yeah, and I need a Ford Transit as well. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> used vehicle prices well, are in there. If you go to Costco, you might. You, <laughs> you might do, and, and you might get a tire as well yeah. and stuff and like that. And the fuel. And the fuel. You get everything <laughs> you need. The other thing is, shop. you don't buy a Ford Transit <laughs> every day, so. To have something like that baked in the inflation figures. Yeah, you'd hope they're like one off. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Costs. Unless yeah. you feel who who does buy a transit every, every day. Every day. If only. I wish. We can all dream. <laughs> <laughs> in big, Phil, in big. Mm. So I, I look I, I, I think that I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. Yeah. But, but and it's doing exactly what you're saying, Mark, just digging under. Yeah. And actually when you're looking at th things such as inflationary pressure, as you rightly say, that they're all they're all they're already booked. Yeah. They're already paid for, so to yeah. speak, and they're real. Yeah. You know, uh, you, everybody's seeing this yeah. uh, when you when you're buying things in the shops. Fuel is the obvious one, and it's the headline grabber. Yeah. But the cost of fuel finds its way into uh, other other price increases. Mm -hmm. So it, it it is definitely real there. Yeah. Um, if you believe the Bank of England, what they say, you know, what, um, and well, I know what one of the questions is, so we'll yeah. answer it. How, you know, when will UK inflation slow down? Yeah. Bank of England are saying it's going to accelerate until year end and then begin to slow yeah. down. And part of the reason UK inflation is is at a higher rate than other countries is we had an artificial cap on energy prices. Yeah. And when that's lifted, it may boost it, it again. It it feeds into the yeah. figures, correct? Although it's it, it's an, that's a question from Heidi anyway yeah. about you know when will US uh, UK inflation follow the US. Yep. side of things um, it's probably an interesting point I don't know Phil or Diane if you have a view on it about the Bank of England making such statements do you think they should be no I don't think they should I think they've I think it's quite a depressing message that comes out of them and I don't think it's actually useful or fair for most normal people in the UK when the banking Bank of England have got the power to regulate and control all of this are giving quite a a doer narrative, mm -hmm. a doom and gloom narrative, but and it'll all become a self-fulfilling prophecy, and you, you see that a lot in the media. I know we talk about that a lot, but if someone gives you a doer message for ten minutes, you'll probably walk out of the room feeling quite, quite depressed. And to say, you you apply the same effect to the economy or people's opinions on the economy, and then they'll probably go and share that with other people who haven't necessarily read or watched the message, and then all of a sudden, we're um we're feeling quite down in the dumps. Um, it's not their job to provide opinion and commentary on it, they really should just stick to underlying data facts and and, and not become kind of a It just becomes a, a sweeping broadcast. message, doesn't it? Yeah. It's not. There's there's not very often any context to it. Like you've just sat mm. there and explained more where the context come from and how it happens and why it happens. Now it's not just from today, that's yeah. it. Then you're looking at an extra 9%. It's just that they are just headlines and statements. It's like, right, job done. I'm off now. I'm just going to leave you all with the chaos. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, and people just don't well, get that. I think Phil makes a good point. You, you, you almost want your bankers to be boring. Yeah. 
and to just study the data and then make policy decision based yeah. on that. And I don't know if it's if it's Andrew Bailey to blame for this because he does appear to be a dower trap chap, uh, absolutely. But you obviously had Mark Carney there, who was very political yeah. before mm. that in terms of the messaging and very kind of suave looking, wasn't he? You know, mm. very slick looking. Mm. And then Bailey comes in, and I think he must be between a rock and a hard place because he looks like someone who'd rather never be seen in public. Mm. But you kind of wonder because of Mark Carney, has Bailey got the same pressure to come out and yeah. speak and say something? Well, there's a couple of examples. <coughs> I'm, I'm going to like turn the tables a little bit on you in, in a couple of months. Now you're not allowed around the host. I know, <laughs> I know, but I know it's a, it's a good story. Um, so I'm I'm going to risk your wrath on that one. Um, we quite frequently what we say is you know that the the headlines are there um, to to sell sell newspapers or get clicks. You know, and a couple of examples. I was talking to a, a, a gentleman the other day who, for one reason or another, hadn't been really out of his house for a, a couple of months. And he'd been watching TV, he'd been reading the papers, and he'd been developed, he had developed an idea of what, the, what life was like outside. And he, he, he managed to get a journey in the car. And he, he was saying, this doesn't look like a country that's on its knees. Yep. And <clears throat> it was the news feeds that he'd been reading for six, seven weeks that it led him to believe that. And then when he saw that the, you know, cars are still on the road, the roads yeah. are as busy mm -hmm. as ever, people are in the shops. It is a different picture. And the, the, bringing you in, you, the story you're telling us about being in London. Yeah. And, and I've I'll, never seen London as busy. No. Couldn't get in a bar, couldn't get in a restaurant. Yeah. Um, and this was just in one particular area of London. The, 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 and these weren't old people say with like all their all their money already as the accusation goes it's, yeah. it's okay for you if you're in your 50s or your 60s these were kids these mm -hmm. were people in their 20s and yeah. uh, yes. 30s and what have you and <clears throat> i was with uh, peter bowles um and uh, we we're near king's cross in london which is where the guardian have their headquarters as well and peter said i feel like marching into the guardian office grabbing a hold of a couple of journalists and taking them here and say Where's this cost of living crisis, which you lot are writing about? Mm -hmm. Because it's even the word crisis. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's there's cost of living pressure for some people. Yeah. I, I'm not I'm not being tone deaf here, by the way. I, I, I understand that some people will yeah. be. But to use words like crisis, uh, what's a crisis at the minute? Is if you're a poor son in the Ukraine getting a sh yeah. shelled, yeah. that's a crisis yeah. for you. You know, from from there. So what the media shouldn't be doing to sell papers, as you rightly say. Is turn everything into a crisis. Yeah, you know they they, they you know, it's 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 a bad word to use. Um, and as you rightly say, Mark, it can instill fear. And so we've talked about in podcasts here as well, which is if we're not careful, people like Andrew Bailey, people like the newspapers, will create a crisis. Well, we, we, we that's a theme that we were talking about as a team on on Monday and Tuesday. That if you believe that something's going to happen, you can talk yourself into it, yeah. right? And what comes first, talking yourself into it or the belief it's going to happen. But it doesn't matter because if you, you will talk yourself into that point where you'll, you'll just go down. And what we try to do here um, with the podcast is just give an alternative view. From an investment point of view, we've got to be absolutely impartial. Yeah. We've got to take the facts, we've got yeah. to look at it, and we've got to position the portfolios for the future. Yeah. And that's that's kind of our role in this. Well, so use the data, Mark, uh, which you get every single day yeah. with the funds. And then it's to actually listen to people's opinions like this. So listen to opinions on the right, or listen to opinions on the left, listen to opinions in the middle, and distill that to create the correct yeah. investment decisions yeah. as well. And I think it's something we do very well, and it's hopefully something which you as our viewers and listeners pick up that you know having a different range of opinions is actually healthy it is uh, from 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 there it's diversification Dan. Well, it's diversification of opinion and yeah. thought yeah. Um, for, for sure and actually it, it's a great point mark what you were saying when we we're talking on monday or tuesday when we had our boards yeah. this week because we've just had a full half year results and we've just marked that against our peer groups in the industry yeah and we are the best performing firm in yes. the uk at the moment uh, in terms in terms of our industry and why is that? It's because we haven't felt sorry for ourselves. No. Our true potential. We haven't had a crisis. What we've done every single day 
you know, you three in this room and all of the rest of the wonderful team here and the advisors who work for us and our clients, we've rolled our sleeves up, we've put our heads down and we've got on with the job in hand. And that's not to say it's been easy, um, not, not at all. No. But as you have good months like July and as you have good months at the start of August, the fruits of your labour are certainly shown. That's right. Uh, we, we carry a, a responsibility for everybody who's invested with us. Yeah. And we've got no time here to feel sorry for ourselves. No. With the responsibility of, of looking after everybody who's invested with us yeah. gets you up in the morning and gets you through the day and, and you you know, the nights that we work is because of our clients and that's the way it is now and it always will be. Yeah. But we communicate it as well. We're not we're not afraid of communicating bad news as well as good news to clients. It is it is here's the information, this is everything that we've got, this is the position that we're in at the minute, these are the decisions that we've taken. And this is the position that we're in now. It's it's all there for clients yeah. to see. We don't shy away from it. And we do come on podcasts and we can be a little bit controversial. And like you say, Dan, we have an opinion. Um doesn't necessarily mean that we're always right or we're always wrong, but we come yeah. on to it's try an and ex- yeah, yeah, to try and yeah. explain opinions and opinion. The position yeah. that yeah. we're in. Yeah. And look that it it, it, it leads nicely onto a question because Diane, you're saying what we're doing for clients here. And we've got a question from Lucas where Lucas is asking, is there a particular point in life where we'd recommend you need access to an advisor? I think it would depend on Lucas' circumstances. So I couldn't necessarily say you would never need a financial advisor. I think if you're looking at things like tax and inheritance tax and capital gains, then you're probably going to need someone that's got qualifications in those areas to make sure that you're not doing something that puts you in a in a difficult position later on. But the information that we have, is, it's on all of the websites, mm-hmm. truepotentialllp.com. We can, he can, Lucas could go on there, he can have a look, try and work out what he knows and what he understands for himself. And if he does want to dip his toe into the investment side of things, he can do that with us by opening an account, an ISA, the easiest account that you can open um, and start small, £10, £5, 50 whatever it might be, and try and understand from there whether he does actually need a financial advisor or the information that we can provide him is sufficient for him to make decisions based yeah. on his own attitude. And Phil, you, you work with advisors every single day here as, as, as well. So keeping on the financial advisor theme, what, what else can they do? Certainly for someone like Lucas, who I guess is probably thinking about getting into investing in pensions. Um, the point I would make to Lucas would be if, if you don't feel like you are on track or on the right set of tracks, then you definitely need to speak to a financial advisor. Their job, what they're wonderful at, is interpreting where you're at and where you want to get to and making sure that you've got a fighting chance of getting there. And what that means is they can give you good advice up front. You might not, you know, with the technology can aid and abet that in years to come in terms of checking your investments on the app, etc., etc. But you'll always need an advisor to put you on the right tracks to, to get, where you, get you where you want to be. Yeah. And there's, you know, we've got over a thousand in True Potential Wealth Management now would be more than happy including all of our wonderful team upstairs but it's really important that we do have these conversations for people like Lucas because there is a savings gap there is an advice gap in the UK where where people aren't necessarily sure who they need to speak yeah. to and when they need to speak to them so my, my advice would always be just speak to one they're they're all very nice people actually yeah. and they'll, they'll they were quite helpful yeah and I was a particularly nice. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was the, the nicest. Yeah. 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 Over, over advisors are <laughs> bad. Yeah, not as good. And, and, and there's a question from Michael. We'll, we'll, we'll keep on the financial advice theme, which is Michael's af- asking, and actually there's a question from William, which is the same as well. So two questions from Michael and William. One is, how often should they be logging into the app and checking their valuations? And indeed then, how often should they then be speaking to their advisor? So maybe... Mark, maybe if you want to talk about the valuations, how often yeah. you maybe recommend people look. I think, Dan, it's, it's a personal decision. Yeah. Um, I know that you and I have got a, the, the habit of, of looking regularly at the, at the, the site um, because we've got money invested in the portfolio and we, we continue to invest in the portfolios. Uh, what what I would like is is that somebody develops like this, this route, you know, through their favourite apps that the, the either daily or weekly, where you start with one, it might be news, it might be sport, etc., and you just go through those three or four, yeah. and the True Potential app becomes part of that regular yeah. mm-hmm. route. We've got clients who log on, log in daily, we've got yeah. some who, who prefer weekly, say Saturday morning, others just do like a, almost a family balance 
she'd yeah. check once a month. So it's it's very much a personal decision. Yeah. Personally, I, I do it once a month now I, I, to look at my valuations. I log yeah. in most days to the app to check it's working, yeah. um, which is it's just a little bit of internal checks so yeah, all of course. us tend to do here. But I tend not to then go and look at the performance. Yeah. I, I look I look over a month to, because if you look at it on, an in, on like a daily basis, it can be up and down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's actually one of the better things about July, and I haven't seen it charted, so you might say I'm wrong here, but it felt like it was a lot of a more boring month. More. Yeah. We, we yeah. didn't see some of the volatility, which I know you and Jeff have been aghast at at times, where you've seen 2%, 3% ups and downs. Well, uh, and, and also, you've, you've had those moves in red day as well. Yes. And the, the app and the valuation process for any investment wouldn't necessarily reflect that intraday movement because no. the, the investments are valued at a, a set point in every day. I think the the other thing about the app is that it's, it's increasingly um, being used by clients as opposed to logging on to a, 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 you know, a desktop or a, a laptop. The app is the most popular route. And other clients are are kind of accessing it for the reward side of things mm -hmm. and then taking the valuation has almost been a secondary yeah. um, reason for going on there. Yeah. So it, it, I've probably said it three times now, personal choice. Personal choice. No, it is, uh, look, it's, it's, it's a good point. And actually, you mentioned about the valuations which people see on the app um, because sometimes we get questions of clients saying, the markets went up 2% yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Why isn't my app up 2%? Yeah. So could you maybe speak about the valuations, Diane? Yeah, so there? just like Mark said there, we get feeds. We get feeds from the managers um, every day. I yeah. think we're, we're on two feeds now. Yeah. Um, so usually by about 5 p.m. in an afternoon, we'll have the most up-to-date position. But if you want to log in at 11 o'clock, mm -hmm. depending on the underlying assets of your funds and where the funds are held, um, you might have a more accurate up-to-date valuation at about 11-ish, but then a little bit later on in the afternoon when we received the secondary feed in from yeah. the other funds, your app will be updated yeah. again. Um, yeah. But yeah, it comes on daily feeds yeah. and we're usually about 24 hours behind the, the, the live market. Yeah, there or there and that's, that's another good reason to maybe why I probably just look once a month yeah. then yeah. as well. And probably the other thing to note, because another common question, I think we've got one here somewhere from from Ryan, um, is, 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 is saying, well, when the FTSE goes up, why have my funds gone yeah. up? And you have to remember the diversification. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're spread across the world here. Well, that's uh, right. And it, 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 coming back to a little bit of what Di said there about it depends where the funds are invested. So with the multi-asset funds that we have, if they're valued at 5 o'clock UK time, uh, as we are now, that, that would be 12 o'clock noon New York time and the, the US market's still open. So you're getting, you're getting a point in time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the, 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 the valuation of UK... When the U.S. market is still open, it's it's not going to give you that yeah. bang-on accurate figure until a couple of days' time down yes, the line. Absolutely. So hopefully that helps clarify things a wee bit for some of the clients asking. Another point to remember is markets aren't open on a weekend. We get that question fairly regularly. Why hasn't my app yeah. moved over the Friday, weekend? Monday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, they're all shut. Like, <gasps> yeah. <gasps> don't, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Well, pivot slate. Like, we've got some some cost of living ideas and about what type of products to look at. I says and, and pensions. So we'll maybe look at them and then we'll pivot across from there across into the the politics and the the, mm. the industry side. So I think the first one is we've, we've got a couple of clients saying, "A, what's better to be investing in right now? Is it an ISA or is it a pension?" And then we've got some clients, uh, one of which is Dave, and another one is, is Martin, asking. Um, should they be looking to take cash out of their ISA or out of their pension to maybe help with living expenses? So mm. who wants to handle what should you invest into? I'll go with that one. Right. I probably should take that one. Um, it's up to the individual, because everybody's different, everybody's got different circumstances, of course, but in terms of the simplistic option between an ISA or a, or a pension, I think, much like we've said throughout this podcast today, be fully equipped with the facts before you make that decision and ideally speak to an advisor who can really give you a good steer. But the the thing to note, especially about a pension, is if you if you choose to invest in an ISA in the short term over a pension just because you can get your hands on the money a bit quicker, you are talking yourself out of the tax relief that you'll receive on a pension, which is significant, especially over a long period of time. It'll compound up and compound up. Yeah. You're really walking away from a... Um, a significant benefit there. Obviously, the benefit of an ISA is it's a lot more flexible. Um, 
you know, you've got flexible allowances now where you can take some money out and put it back in and not lose any allowance, which is yeah. a good feature of the product. Um, it really, this is a cop-out answer, and I'm sorry. It does depend, and it depends on your age, especially. Um, Why did you look at Diane when you said that? I know. Because you're the youngest person on this. Oh, hell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get slapped well, there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the, the thing to bear in mind, you're right about personal, depending on what age. I'd also recommend you think, why are you investing mm. as well? These are both ISA and pension are meant to be medium to long term uh, instruments here. They're, they're meant to, you're meant to put the money away and then not touch it. I, I think if you think, I'm going to put some money into my ISA and I might then need to take it out in six months time for my gas bill, yeah. I'd say you shouldn't be putting the money mm. into the ISA. You pop that in your bank. Yes, we know you'll, we've talked about inflation to death in other podcasts or not. So in real times, you're losing money there with nine percent inflation versus a one and a half percent rate from the bank if you're lucky but that's a safer place to put it if you think you're going to need it in the short term we we see it quite often that that, that clients look at this and it's a good question because it comes up time and time again please don't use your ISA as a secondary bank account yeah. now because it's it's as you said Dan it's meant to be a, a, a longer term tax efficient um, method of saving and seeing money grow so if you if you can possibly avoid it, rate you know take money out of the that a cash reserve if you have something, think twice, think three times before you take money out of an ISA. Yeah. Um. And 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 also drawing you know lump sums out of pensions. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing to think about with where markets have been. Yes, we've had a positive July, all been well. We'll have a, a good August as well. But if you look at the last six months, where it has been volatile, it's been. Yeah. It's been rocky as well. Um, I'm not good enough at maths to explain this properly, but maybe one of yourselves are. But bear in mind, if you lose 2% in your portfolio, mm -hmm. it's not as simple as just saying we're going to make 2% back up no. to get back to yeah. where you were. You've got to make, say, 4% yeah. say, to, to back up. So it's if there are some losses in there right now, they will wash through and they will get there. But if you start taking your money out mm -hmm. now and yeah. you start raiding your rice or start raiding your pension, you are baking a loss in. Because yeah. once you take it out, the losses yeah. crystallized. Yeah. It's crystallized, absolutely, yeah. Mark. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I hope that helps with, with Dave and Martin in terms of where should we take it out. I'd say try not to yeah. at all right now. Try to use those instruments for what they're absolutely designed for as, as well. Um, we'll move across to the, 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 the politics side of things now. We've, we've got um, a couple of questions. I think that the, the tender all revolves. We've got one from Ricky. We've got a is that Ricky or Rishi? It's, oh. it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. I think Sunak will be the, the best for the <laughs> job. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Um, but, it, you know, the, the, the questions are about what would be better for the UK economy. Would it be Rishi Sunak or, or Liz Trust? And I'll, I'll go around and I'll, I'll ask all three of you for, for opinions on, on A, what it could mean for yourselves as individuals, but B, either as investment professionals, advice professionals or within the technology side of things, Diane, with yourselves, what it could mean to you first. Um, I'll try not to abstain. I haven't really, this is going to sound bad, but I haven't really considered the difference between the two of them for me because I don't believe either of them. If they're just prepared to stand there and say whatever it is that they want to say that they think is going to have them like voted in. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter because is it going to change anything? Certainly in the short term, not personally, not for me, it won't. I think it will be a good few years before we do see any fundamental change because in reality, what can they do overnight? doesn't matter how many um, you, policies they come up with. So if you had a Liz Trust come in and put a tax cut, which she said she, she wants to do with yeah. an emergency budget, would that not be appealing to yourself? As I mean, it would be, but yeah. isn't this the second time she said she's going to do something that she's probably then going to go, actually, can't really oh, do really. that. This yeah. is just what I said I would do. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, tax cuts are always going to be appealing to, to everybody who doesn't want more money, mm -hmm. certainly more money to retain. Um, but I, I, I just can't see it happening. But it played devil's you know, you know, advocate here. Should we be paying more tax to help the UK economy rebuild? Which is what, say, Sunak yeah. said. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. 
good to Mark. Good to Mark. Diane, um, for the first time in Diane's I'm, life, uh, she's speechless. So so it's got her on camera as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move across, across to Mark. Mark, what, what would be your view? Or if you have one. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think we talk about impartiality. Um, we, when we saw the, the, the uh, removal of Boris Johnson, markets, world markets weren't affected yeah, by yeah. it. Um, we've got, we're, we're in the stage now of, of dealing with personalities because they're trying to endear themselves um, to, to the public and to, to, get, uh, to get into office. Yeah. Between the two of them, in my view, Rishi Sunak had his chance. He was Chancellor. We can't forget that. Mm -hmm. And it's no good suddenly opening the curtains on a brand new day and forgetting what happened yesterday. Yeah. You know, he did have a chance. Um, he was in, in, in uh, number 11 when furlough came through, which still has to be paid for. Yeah. And there was ways of raising money, which are not necessarily taxes, which would have helped the UK. And he, he missed that chance. Yeah. Liz Truss, as Di said, there, there's been a couple of U-turns, but we, we simply don't know. Mm -hmm. um, what would be good for the UK, I think we, we just need to have um, a business-led economy yeah. um, and, and good, strong companies yeah. because th that, that'll filter through to everybody and it'll make for a better Britain. I, make I, Britain better. Make Britain hey. better. I've heard that before. <laughs> um, but you, you made a good point, Mark, about when, when, when Johnson was kicked out. Um, or, or stabbed in the back, or however you mm. you you who who stabbed him, Dan? Well, you know, his pal next door, <laughs> <laughs> Brutus, the yeah. noisy neighbour. Yes, um, but you know, and the and the markets just moved on yeah. um, from from it as well. And it's you you probably don't know the exact number, or you may do you know, doing your disservice. But when you look at the FTSE one hundred, there's a, a significant majority yeah. of that those firms aren't even really UK based. They're no, just sort right. of listed yeah in, right. in in london you know Correct. so we have to remember actually a lot of the uk economy that you know the footy 100 is the top 100 firms yeah. uh they're a, a worldwide based oh. uh, uh, you know depend on many more economies than just the united kingdom uh, and, and as a colleague of ours keeps stating you know the uk is the fifth largest economy in the world so yeah. you, that shouldn't be forgotten yeah and if the country can be strong and there's good growth in there it will benefit everybody yes yeah, and 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 Phil, kind of, do you get a vibe from the advisors? About you know, are, are, are they bothered about it? Are they aware of it? I think they're bothered about it. Yeah. I think they're also aware of it, but their views will be legion. <laughs> There'll yeah. be far too many views on it. Um, to be honest, because uh, people are either very interested in this or they they try and distance themselves as far from it as as possible. And I think it's been a poor campaign. Uh, in terms of the, in my personal opinion, for the leadership, it's the, there's nothing worse than seeing people like slither and slime around to try and make you like them. Yeah. Um, going back to what we were talking about before regarding the Bank of England, etc. We just want, as Mark mentioned, a business-like approach, something factual, as in here's the actual plan, and this is why I'm going to like speak to us like an adult. Don't mm -hmm. just keep saying, "Build back better" or these yeah. daft three uh, words. <laughs> things because obviously all the voters are stupid and that's all we can remember. <laughs> um, the advisors have got totally different views on it and I think it obviously depends where they are in the UK and what their client bank looks like etc but uh, to pick up on old Ricky's question I um, I don't particularly like either of them. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a difficult thing but I'll, I'll tell you what's the most difficult about it is we don't actually have a say in it no. unless you remember the Conservative yeah. Party. Yeah. Um, because this is an internal leadership yeah, campaign. Yeah. And I think some of the reason why people are irate um, is I think the Tories won an overwhelming majority the last time because they actually voted for Johnson. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know you vote for your local MP, yeah. but certainly, the, and this is not scientific, but the feedback I pick up off people when I ask them is, is actually, I voted for Johnson mm -hmm. from, from there. So I think if they've... Whoever comes in has to be, has to really beware the backlash uh, here uh, from there. And probably going back to one of your earlier points, Diane, and, and actually then feeding on from what both Mark and Phil have said, I think we need to see something 
good in terms of some decisions made, some policy changes. And exactly what you say, Phil, I am doing this and that will result in this. Yeah. Um, and I think if you can give people a bit of certainty and a bit of a, a flight path, a route, so to speak, I think it'll settle things down somewhat. Yeah. It just feels like they're so insincere. I, like when you hear them talk about it, yes, they talk about the things that they're interested in with conviction. Yeah. But when you're interested in something, you can talk about it with conviction, but it doesn't mean that you're sincere about what yeah. you're about to say. And that's what just it drives me nuts. You, you can't get to the bottom of them just honestly saying, yeah. this is the position, this is the position they're in. I would love to be able to reduce taxes, but I can't for this factual mm-hmm. reason. You never, ever get there. It's just fluff around the edges yeah. all of the time. Well, Liz is very, very keen to get into Vogue magazine. I've been reading. Well, she's been asking so. lots of questions on that, yes. so she's obviously... Is that uh, to appeal more cosmopolitan? She, um... It was Sturgeon's this, retort uh, yeah. back to, because obviously Liz Truss had said she was just ignore her and yeah. she'll go away, which, I mean, in fairness, I think that's possibly the one thing she's said that I do 100% agree with. Um, so, yeah. Nick, well, 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 hang on, <laughs> down, we'll be marching on Berwick soon. No, if, 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 if you really want to polarise a party against you, oh. just make silly statements mm-hmm. like that, you know, which feeds absolutely into the anti-establishment yeah. rhetoric, which the SNP do, and I'd be doing backflips with excitement if I was Sturgeon when, yep. when she yeah. said that, you know, so it's, it's, but yes, that's a whole other debate for a yeah. whole <laughs> other day. Um, I'm not getting involved in no, that No, no. Uh, a, couple, a couple more questions. I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of time. We'll, we'll, we'll move back into financial services and away from, from, from politics. Um, Diane, we've got a question from Steve. Um, this may be Steve Hutton. Uh, how can I consolidate my pensions? So within the site, within the website, you can you can go on, you can add your policies. We, we simply ask for a, a provider and a policy number. I think they're the only mandatory fields that we need. Yeah. Um, and then the system will essentially do all the work from there. We will fire off the request to the relevant providers um, and those providers will subsequently respond with, here, yes, we've got the authority from the client yeah. to transfer you their pot of money and we will consolidate them for them on behalf of, did he say this was one from Dan? Steve. Steve? Yeah. Oh, of course, Steve. Um, we will consolidate the pot on behalf of that client yeah. into a single pension yeah. um, within the so, system. So basically, let us know. Yeah. We'll do all the chasing. Absolutely. All, all the work for you. Yeah. And then link, link with that, Phil, is probably something you see quite often with the advice. A question from Katie about how long can an ISA transfer take? Uh, it can take quite a while, but it usually doesn't. That's the good news. It all depends on where we're getting the ISA monies from they can happen in three to four days actually uh, depending on the provider if they sell down then we receive the funds um some providers do take a little bit longer some people out there are still not quite as technologically enabled as we are yeah. um but a nicer transfer is a relatively easy thing in the world of transfers to enact so less than a week in the main um you'll probably know the data on it and from, from the platform but less than a week to two weeks yeah it depends, as you say, that the key in it is where where is it now? Yeah. Mm. Who holds it? Yeah. Because some people aren't too keen to release money. They're not too keen to release it, are they? No. It's exactly the same with the pension consolidation yeah. side yeah. of things. Yeah. Um, last couple about, we're going to talk a bit about investment in terms of markets. Um, and also there's a question about ethical side of things, which I think links in with that. We've obviously had Russia and Ukraine, which has disrupted markets earlier mm. in the year. I think that's been talked in great detail from you mark and from the rest of your team yeah we saw a bit of saber rattling with the the americans get involved with taiwan china situation as well was, yeah. was there much movement with the markets uh, there there was a little bit but nothing significant no and nothing that's been lasting yeah not like the uh the russian ukraine situation like russian ukraine no uh, and which then leads me on to the last question and it it's because uh, i think this would be an interesting debate I think to finish things off which is uh, we've got a question from David who's asking about the panel's thoughts about ethical investments um, particularly not investing in arms manufacturing Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to kick that one off with with a personal view here as well which was if it wasn't for arms manufacturers say in Britain or in Europe supplying the Ukraine to be able to defend themselves um, they probably would have been overrun right now by Russia from there. So you could say, is that ethical to help a country protect themselves? 
obviously you look, it's not ethical because it involves killing people, perhaps, but it involves them defending themselves. And I think this is the real crossroads. This is the real difficulty yeah. when it comes to what's ethical because you might say, Phil, no, it's completely unethical to provide killing machines to people. Whereas you might say, well, no, with those machines, they're stopping people getting yeah. killed, Diane, as well. And this is ethical can mean one thing to you, mm -hmm. one thing to yeah. you, Diane. And I suppose, Mark, this is the, the conundrum uh, you uh, and your investment colleagues and the fund managers we deal with have to look at. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a huge area. And as you say, is, is the armaments industry right or wrong? And I think that, that if it was, if it was a, an absolute blanket type of policy, global, yeah. um, you'd say probably wrong. But you cannot have one side who's armed and another side who's not. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you won't be able to preserve democracy. No. Um, do you, would you invest willingly in firms who are building landmines, things like that? You, the answer to that is probably a no. Mm. Um, but what what we've got to do is, is it, it, it's much much broader than armaments, and yeah. it, it's about it's about development and it's about preservation of the rights that that we're exercising now by having this debate. Um, so it's it's an area that we we look at very very carefully when we're putting the portfolios together, and it's going to be coming an increasing part of what we do. Yeah. Um, but we we've got to do again. I, I use the term impartial. You know, we've got one hundred and fifty thousand clients investing in the portfolios. Everybody will have a different view. Yeah. Um, so what we'll do is make sure that we do what's right for the vast majority of our clients. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and invest in areas which are are, are right for them and but, right for us, but also be transparent, which then Absolutely. in turn helps those clients. Absolutely, you know, which is there's nothing worse than what you see with some of these ethical investment funds out there, where it's almost what we now call greenwashing. Yeah, where they're just in. We do this and we do that, yeah. and almost tick some boxes uh, within there. That's 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 bad. It's, mm. it, it's a bad way to treat a client. It's a bad way to market yourself as well. You should be straightforward you should be direct about what you do and well, then you let the personalities the individuals say that's for me or that's not yeah, for me yeah and I, you know another example is the energy industry where where bp you know a lot of people say well that's it's carbon based therefore you know it it, it it's going to be a polluter but then bp are investing 36 billion dollars in a clean energy plant in western australia yes so it the diversification will, will continue and regulation is going to point us in a way where you've got to look at this yeah. and it, it will be built into the portfolios um, and in, on an increasing basis. But the idea of investing in one of our portfolios is to see your money grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, companies who are sustainable, um, that's, that's the area for us to look into, the sustainability of, of, of of cash flow, yeah. sustainability of profitability, which, which in turn leads to an increase in share price, yeah. and you see a growth in the, the value of those yeah, which, investments, which, which in turn creates a sustainable future for yeah. our clients. Yeah, for yeah. people like David who's won wondering about when to take his drawdown out and Not things right, like that. Right. He has a sustainable income stream. He has a sustainable retirement and a happy retirement. Well, here's what, here's as one well. as well, Dan. You know, we talk about the oil industry um, and the the, the way that that. that that governments, including ours, are looking to, to have windfall taxes on, on uh, BP, Shell, etc., yeah. etc. What you've got to remember is the dividends that these companies pay go into pension funds. Mm -hmm. Not just the pension funds that we run, but every pension fund in the UK. So if you cap the dividends or if you say to the companies you can't pay dividends, Eventually, that's going to end up in smaller pensions. It hits the pockets. So yeah. you've got to, it's a it's a vexed area. Yeah. It's one you've got to tread very very carefully when you're going through. Yeah, no, uh, for sure. And I think it's it's fortunately they don't help themselves. No, no, <laughs> no. something. But you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. With, we're at the performance of private companies, yeah. which underpin in yeah. ultimately all of our investments. There'd be no growth. No, there'd be, there'd be nothing uh, within there. But again, probably a podcast subject for another day when it comes to say energy suppliers, or even when it comes to banks and things. Yeah. I think what it shows is an inherent lack of competition, yeah. which actually really exists yeah. in in the UK, which then means you're at the mercy of stupid prices going yeah. on and 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 reductions not getting passed to the consumer. Yeah, as as, as well. But we'll we'll leave that one because that'll. Spend
spiral me off. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be going all day. We'll be, we will be going all day. I think, so Stan, just before we close it yeah. down, though, it's, it's got to be said that there's opportunities presented going forward, and, and th- th- there's lots of green energy out mm-hmm. there, um, or uh, ways to invest in green energy yeah. that we, we, we take advantage I, of. I kind of, I wouldn't say I like it, but I, I like a bit of disruption. I like a bit of chaos. Yeah. Uh, why? Because it, op- it opens up those opportunities. Yeah. And opportunities favour the bold. I think we're a bold organisation. I think we like the opportunities. You've seen some of that in the results, which we were talking about before. It would have been easy for us again to have just hidden away, felt sorry for ourselves, but we didn't. We've, we've went out and met the challenge there and we've benefited. Yeah from that and that's the way in which we'll I know Mark we'll continue to invest in there is Correct. looking for those opportunities, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and looking to meet the demand and ultimately create those sustainable income, that sustainable profit for our clients. That's right. As well. So it's a great summary speech. Well done. Uh, <laughs> there as there as well. So um Thank you to everybody. I think we got through all of the questions, which is a record as well, normally mm-hmm. for me. I normally I deal with one question, and that's, <laughs> that's the, end, the end of that. So thank you to everybody for, for coming in with your questions. Thank you to Diane, Mark, and Phil for helping uh, answer them as well. I hope you enjoyed today, um, and I hope that you have a lovely weekend. All the best, everybody. Thank you. If you're interested in taking your investing to the next level, or would like to know more about the options available to you when you retire, then download our free guides to ICES and pensions. These are available in the video description below.